So we're still on track on becoming a good surgeon and this is your first pit stop. We are talking about surgical nutrition and metabolism and this section will deal with the substrate metabolism changes. So we have three substrates as foods in the human body. These include the carbohydrates, the lipids and the fats. We'll see when a stressor comes to a body, be it an elective surgery, a trauma or a burn, what happens to all of these. So we'll see the altered carbohydrate metabolism. We'll also talk about the altered lipid and altered fat metabolism. So first of all, let's get on with the, let's get on with the carbohydrates. So there's a critical illness. Uh, it can be either due to a trauma or sepsis or burn or a surgery. So there's a stressor that has come to the body. Now, first of all, there would be glycolysis. So the glycogen stores in the body would be released. There would be glycolysis and utilization that would lead to an increase in the glucose. The increase in the glucose or hyperglycemia, it provides fuel for the brain, the RBCs and the kidney. We know the brain, the RBCs, they use only glucose for their metabolism. So they require a steady supply of glucose and this is done by glycolysis. So now when the glucose stores, they run low, lipolysis comes into action. So this critical illness would cause lipolysis and increase in the fatty acids. Now this lipolysis would cause the production of ketones and ketones will be uh, providing fuel to the brain by production of glucose. Now again, uh, along with lipolysis, the muscle, the muscular component of the body, that is the uh, lean body mass, it tends to break down. So there's loss of the lean body mass, the loss of the lean body mass results in the production of amino acids. These amino acids will be used for protein synthesis as well as gluconeogenesis, that is new production of the glucose. This new production of the glucose will elevate the amount of glucose in the body that will increase the amount of glucose and would contribute to the steady supply of the glucose. At the same time, there would be production of urea which would be secreted via urine. This protein synthesis will help in the tissue repair and the wound healing process. So summarizing it, a stressor first causes glycolysis. Now glycolysis causes a hyperglycemia. This hyperglycemia is utilized as fuel for brain RBCs and kidneys. This is followed by lipolysis. Lipolysis because production of free fatty acids and ketones. The ketones provide fuel for the brain at the same time. Uh, the muscles, they tend to break down and cause the production of amino acids. These amino acids, they undergo protein synthesis, which help in acute inflammatory proteins, acute inflammatory response, and also in tissue repair and wound healing. At the same time, there is gluconeogenesis from the proteins and as a result of which it contributes to the production, to the steady supply of glucose. Now, this altered carbohydrate metabolism can be divided into the ebb phase and the flow phase and represented by the figure that is shown by the graph that is shown below. So the hyperglycemia, the intensity gradually reflects the severity of the stressor. So here you can see um, this is the time and this is the energy expenditure. In ebb phase, there's decrease in the energy expenditure because the body is trying to conserve its energy in the flow phase. The, um, in, there's increase in energy expenditure and this increase is in directly related to the stressor. So hyperglycemia, the intensity of hyperglycemia is also related to the stressor and generally affects the severity of the stressor. In ebb phase, the insulin levels are low so the glucose production is minimally elevated. However, in the flow phase, the hepatic gluconeogenesis occurs at a faster pace from the peripheral tissue release precursors. Now the peripheral tissues are releasing precursors, primarily the amino acids, the ketone bodies. Now these help in hepatic gluconeogenesis. At the same time, the hyperglycemia is persisting because of 
um, glycolysis, lipolysis, <laughs> proteolysis, also hyperglycemia persists. Insulin levels are normal or slightly elevated and it suggests a relative insulin resistance even at this point in time. So it is represented in the figure here in, in the graph here in ebb phase energy expenditure is decreased here you can see this is the ebb phase in flow phase. The energy, um, uh, the energy expenditure is exponentially increased and it is directly related to the stress that is present in the body. So moving on to altered protein metabolism. So nitrogen loss increases since there's a breakdown of the lean muscle mass, breakdown of the muscles of the body. So negative balance increases. So nitrogen loss increases. It correlates to the extent of injury of the victims pre and victims pre-existing nutritional status. So there are two elements. It correlates to the injury as well as the victims pre-existing nutritional status. Say if a patient and if an obese patient undergoes a stressor, uh, if uh, the, uh, this patient has more lipids to be metabolized, so the bodily uh, fat, uh, the, so the um, the muscle muscular component of the body would not be affected as much. However, if a um, wasted, uh, if a ketchexic patient goes to the um, undergoes this. Uh, uh, condition uh, has altered protein metabolism more of the proteins would be lost in this patient now exogenous calories they are important to maintain a neutral nitrogen balance because there's negative nitrogen balance so you need, need exogenous calories skeletal muscles are the chief source of the nitrogen which is lost in urine after the injury and kidney and GI tract also release alanine which is re uh, re uh, used for the glucogenetic purposes so uh, alanine is also being used at uh, in kidneys and the GI tract so talk, let's talk about altered lipid metabolism there's increased metabolic rates after injury or the elective surgery. We've talked about it. The triglycerides are released from the adipose tissue for energy production. So the glucose administered at this point in time it ha it has minimal effects, a result which is due to continuous neuroendocrine stimulation. So if you even give glucose at this point in time, the altered lipid metabolism would not improve. And this is because this continuous neuroendocrine stimulation for lipolysis to occur. There's mobilization oxidation of the free fatty acids and this the process of mobilization and excretion and oxidation of free fatty acid is accelerated. Now ketone synthesis is minimal. It occurs independently of protein catabolism. So there's minimal ketone synthesis um, at this point in time. Now, when the patient is injured severely and remains unfed, fat and protein stores become delayed rapidly. So as this duration would be increasing, as the duration of uh, starvation increases, the stores of fat and protein, they, start, they become depleted rapidly. Now, malnutrition also increases susceptibility to infections. Uh, complications, multiple organ system failure and sepsis because body is already in a lot of stress. It has a stressor now uh, the fuels of the the fuel uh, the body is deprived of the fuel and is using its own components to generate this fuel. So there's a lot of stress on the body and it can lead to a variety of complications, a variety of infections, organ system failure and sepsis and can finally lead to death of the patient. So this section was all about the alterations in metabolism that occur due to a stressor. It was a simple section with simple flow sheets. I hope you understood it and liked it for further sections. Keep watching scardio.com.